may you find yourself journeying through the broken, boggy terrain of the Minecraft swamp. Likely could you encounter one of this biome's passive mobs. One that appears fairly simple and straightforward, or so it seems. How much is there to know about Minecraft's frog? Let's find out. The Temperate Frog. One of Minecraft's three frog variants. Home naturally only to the swamp biome, these temperate frogs spawn in groups ranging in a variety of sizes. To gather myself some data, I ventured across approximately 50 different swamps to capture exactly 50 different spawn sightings, from which saw a total of 155 frogs. Purely from my results alone, I found groups of two happened to be the most common. Some swamps, even the larger sized ones, spawned with no frogs in, but nothing too unexpected there. However, I did run into the cutest swamp biome I've come across yet. What did surprise me though, were spotting a fresh spawn of frogs grouped eight members large, all very much within typical group spawning distance. I chose to leave this out from my findings and just jot it down to a lucky rare sighting of two group spawns of the same mob that happened to spawn in the exact same location until it happened again, only a few sightings later, with a fresh spawn of seven. This in conjunction with discovering a frog naturally spawning perfectly lonely six times, I decided to include the information of every spawn sighting of the 50 that I had set out on search for, which were all from frogs located just moments after their chunks had generated. They tended to prefer each other's company for the most part, staying relatively grouped together, even over long periods of time. They will occasionally stray from one another, but they don't seem to go too far without rubber banding closer back towards their nearest group member. So if you encounter a frog along your adventures, good chance you'll find another nearby. Frogs prefer to spend most of their time just slowly meandering about the surface, across all the muggy grass of these wetlands, and often perform their iconic manoeuvre, a leap through the air. It's amusing to watch sometimes actually, and if you find yourself in a swamp with one of these fellas, notice how they're particularly fond of leaping onto lily pads. This is indeed something frogs love to do. A frog's leap can vary in both height and distance, with some leaps reaching eight blocks high. To my understanding, eight blocks appears to be the common claim for a frog's maximum jump height. However, Upon running my own tests on this, I was able to witness frogs vertically surpass eight blocks in altitude many multiples of times, with one frog legitimately conquering 13 blocks high. Founded from only 15 minutes of observation, consequently making the frog the highest jumping mob in Minecraft, besting their jumping rivals, goats, whose maximum jump height is commonly claimed to be 10 blocks high, which after some testing does appear to be the goat's maximum jump height, at least according to my observations anywho. So at least from what my own personal research shows me, contrary to perhaps what's the more common belief, it's actually frogs who wear the crown for the highest leaping ability of all Minecraft mobs, at least for now. 
to help put it into better perspective. This remarkable talent of theirs makes them more than capable of confidently scaling any tree of the swamp biome. Alternatively, if a frog were to jump just five blocks higher than the 13 block leap we witnessed earlier, then there'd be a possibility frogs would sometimes just randomly bounce to their own death. Frogs will die from 18 blocks of full damage, but naturally take less full damage than most other mobs. They'll start taking damage when falling from a minimum of nine blocks, meaning frogs, although infrequently, still quite literally hurt themselves from their own jumps. But if that weren't enough of a fall from grace, frogs can also misjudge their jumps in much less forgiving ways. Yeah, not as much precision as they have potential, which isn't only noticeable when leaping, but even when just strolling. In case the curiosity, a frog's leaping ability is no doubt enhanced by splash potions of leaping. Is it anything significant though? Well, I tallied 50 jumps from frogs both unaffected and affected by the splash potion of leaping to see how their results would compare. Turns out, frogs with the boost juice bragged an extra 55 blocks of total jump height from their 50 examined jumps, compared to the 50 from the frogs without, ultimately boasting an average height advantage over them by roughly one block. The results were virtually the same when comparing the distance of the frog's jump too strongly indicating the buff evenly enhances the subject's leap in all directions. Frogs wield five hearts of health, standing half a block tall. Being that they are a passive mob, this means they will not attack a player, even if provoked. Huh? They drop no items upon dying, even if by the hands of a player or tamed wolf. Only a small amount of experience will be released after their death. Like various other passive and neutral mobs, by using a lead, they can be tied to a fence post many times over, come for joy rides on boats, and stop you from getting in them forever and ever and ever. And actually serves as a great option if you wish to prevent the little hijackers from despawning, just in case you wish to keep them around for adoption later on. But aside from their obvious quirky cuteness, what makes keeping these fellas around as future pets a potentially desirable option? We'll come back to this question soon, as to help answer it, best we know all our options first, which means finding the frog's second naturally spawning variant, and to do so, we're going to have to travel somewhere a little warmer. Mangrove, swamps, pottering beneath the overgrown thickets of this tepid biome. To best catch a glimpse of the frog's most heat adapted variant, we'll need to try get close enough in order to reveal their full beauty. The warm frog. Sharing spawning habits identical to their orange, temperate counterparts, this pale variety of frog can only be naturally found living amongst the mangrove swamp biome. Distinct for their pure white body, this breed especially are accustomed to the watery abundance this lush biome offers them, making them particularly familiarized swimmers. It's in this biome especially that we can see with greater clarity how frogs avoid swimming too deep underwater, preferring to actually swim quite close to a water's surface. 
they are also unable to drown underwater, capable of holding their breath for however long they need. Despite frogs spending most of their time on solid ground, it's clear their aquatic ability is not to be underestimated. The underwater speed of these amphibians challenges most of Minecraft's aquatic mobs, which should be no surprise really, as after all, let us not forget, before frogs ever take their first steps, these creatures are born swimming, meaning they can of course be bred. Holding a slime ball will lure in any nearby frogs towards you, so as long as you have at least a couple slime balls on hand, you may play Cupid to your heart's content. Whether it's land or underwater, two frogs that have each been given a slime ball will enter a loving dance with one another, where a little bit of experience will be left behind for collection once it's concluded, and they'll not be eligible to dance again for a short while. This is when the pregnant frog will go off to look for an open patch of water adjacent to a solid block, including lily pads even, where she will decide to lay her eggs, known as frog spawn. Each pregnant frog will only lay one group of these eggs per dance. Since frog spawn cannot naturally generate with terrain, this is the only way for frog spawn to spawn. Of course, best not interfere with their eggs, as once they lay floating on their chosen patch of water, they cannot be picked up, even with a tool wielding the silk touch enchantment. Now, it is actually possible for frog spawn to hatch literally instantly, but can also take up to 10 minutes to do so. So with just a little bit of patience, before long, you will have life. Tadpoles. Anywhere between two to five can hatch from a single patch of frog spawn. And being that frog spawn cannot naturally generate, this means tadpoles too are unable to naturally generate. So therefore, seeing tadpoles can only be the result of your own frog breeding efforts, or of another player's, which in a way is rather cool. Like their parents before them, these little larval are also passive, but hold two less hearts of health than them, sitting at just three hearts. Volumetrically, they are the second smallest mob in Minecraft, sitting between the pufferfish in third place and the baby turtle in first. Speaking of course, at the time of filming for this episode. Although being the baby mob of the frog, tadpoles are unique in the sense that Minecraft classifies them as their own separate mob, a mob that's different from its parent, and even have their own spawn egg, which in a way is understandable, given some of their characteristics. Having said that, it appears the apple hasn't fallen too far from the tree, still sharing similar tendencies as their folks. The likeness is strangely adorable in a morbid way, sadly. But if one were to meet an early end, as with other baby class mobs, tadpoles too drop no items or experience. Unlike their parents, however, Tadpoles don't have a preference of underwater altitude. They're happy to cruise at any depth and will continue cruising until they mature into a frog. Growing up into a frog takes them 20 minutes, a full Minecraft day. And if you have more handy, but advisably more than you really need, you may feed them slime balls also, which will accelerate their growth speed. Again? Do you all have a death wish? Well, you're lucky. If you do have plenty of slime balls, then raising a population of frogs is no doubt a super quick process, only made easier by tadpoles also being able to be lured in when holding slime balls, just like their mature counterparts. Cuby. Hmm? What? Hi. Maybe just settle down a bit with the feeding there. Yeah? I think it's best we keep it sensible for the camera. And back he goes. Unbelievable. Now what's he doing? Should we say something? Cubes, you're aware that the slime balls are luring them out of the water, right? Oh yeah, no, they do that anyway. <sighs> Absolutely spoiling a tadpole with this food of theirs could see a newborn enter adulthood in less time than it could take a frog to just find a place to lay eggs. Doing this will use up a lot of slime balls. 
Despite being classed as a completely separate mob from their adult form, if you were to name a tadpole with a name tag, they'll still keep their name when they've matured into a frog. How a tadpole's childhood carries out and how they procreate as frogs in adulthood are both rather similar to that of turtles. Both lay their eggs in the interest of nearby water, and both their hatchlings likely spend their entire youth completely independent, alone and apart from their parents. This coincidence of characteristics is owed to their amphibious nature, as it's notably common for most amphibians to outright abandon their eggs once laid. It can breed quite the lonely childhood indeed. We can actually witness this unfold simply by observing their time while in youth. Unlike when they're all grown up as frogs, notice how tadpoles aren't actually naturally inclined to stay grouped together. They are each on their own independent watery paths. And this behavior gives them every chance to very literally wander off as far as their waters can take them. And speaking of which, this little guy happens to be doing just that. He strayed from his siblings and now finds himself in distant territory. A dangerous place for a tadpole to end up. Lush caves are full of these aquatic predators. Although a tadpole is able to survive an axolotl's initial ambushing attack, they haven't quite developed the understanding to flee from harm. Not only at the sight of a predator, but even after being harmed by one, which would have made this poor guy that axolotl's next snack. So for this chap here, He's got water buckets to thank for his narrow escape, which can be used on a tadpole to capture them. Doing so for the first time will also reward you with the Bucket Bucket achievement, or called Advancements if you're in the Java Edition realm. Once a tadpole's in a bucket, they're basically in a time capsule, as from the moment they're captured in one, it puts their aging process on pause. Once they're back into the water again, their aging resumes, right from the exact instant when it was halted by being captured in their watery time capsule. Oh, while we're here, this plant is called a big drip leaf. And just like how frogs enjoy jumping onto lily pads, they also very much take joy in leaping onto big drip leaves as well, no matter their height. Only to realize they're probably a little heavy for the leaf. Since big drip leaves naturally spawn in lush caves, if you wish to make them accessible for your frogs to play with, you'll have to of course collect some from here, and transport them over to what would be some very grateful frogs, I'm sure. Or take your frogs on an excursion to the lush cave. Axolotls won't attack them, just don't bring their baby teddy balls. Now, if you don't have a name tag handy, but you still want to give a name to any mob captured in a water bucket, then if you've got an anvil lying around, you can always place them on an anvil and name them this way too. As once they're released, they'll simply retain the name given to them from the bucket, and the bucket will have the name Bucket. There you go. Well, buddy, happy adventure. No, no, not back towards the lush cave again. Observing the frog's natural habitats during the daytime, mangroves and swamps can indeed appear quite the still and sombre place. But during the nighttime, in these biomes, that still mostly stays the same. But all the more lucky you'll be if you're able to catch a glimpse of what may occur. When night begins to fall, something rises to a frog's intrigue. Minecraft's moon is of great interest to the frog. Every time the sun sleeps below the sheet of the horizon, 
Minecraft's moon awakes from the opposite end of the sky to appear in one of eight different appearances called phases that all belong to the moon's lunar cycle. Full moon, waxing gibbous, first quarter, waxing crescent, new moon, waning crescent, third quarter, and waning gibbous are each of the eight phases the moon cycles through in said order too. And so when moonlight arrives in swamps and mangrove swamps, the brighter it is, the better the spawning chance of frog prey. For the big and medium sized slimes, they have nothing to worry about. But if you're a small slime in either of these biomes, then you do. The more the moon's surface area that's visible, the more likely it is for these poor little things to spawn from the moonlit marsh. If it were a new moon, being a total eclipse, it'd produce no moonlight, a sad night to be a frog. However, our camera team is in luck. Tonight, there's a full moon. Going from cute and quirky to absolute savages as they turn cubes into circles at any opportunity they get, whether it be by land, on a lead, underwater, or by boat. Even though small slimes may spawn at night in swamps and mangrove swamps, they are able to persist through dawn, which still doesn't exempt frogs from hunting them on sight spitting out prey that succumbed to the fate of their tongue, leaving them behind as a slime ball. Just in case you were curious though, using frogs in a slime ball farm, most might consider a waste of frog. They probably aren't the most advisable choice to aid with that type of farm. You'll likely want to save any frogs for a different type of farm. And these regurgitated balls of slime serve as a hint for why you may want to have a few handfuls handy. The reason for that is, Timmy? The biome that a tadpole is within when it matures into a frog determines which variant it grows up as. And having matured in a snowy biome, our buddy has blossomed into the magnific cold frog. The third and final variant of the frog. Unique for being the only variant unable to naturally spawn, the cold frog can only be the result of a tadpole. Although unique in this way, the behavior of cold frogs are otherwise identical as their other colored kin. On the topic of which, any variant of frog can breed with one another, but this doesn't influence the variant of frog that any of their tadpoles grow into in any way, as that still falls back onto the biome a tadpole is inside at the time of maturing. Using a frog spawn egg in our favorite void, the end, will actually summon a cold frog 
Using one in the nether will instead summon a warm frog, but of course, neither of these realms can a frog naturally spawn in. Whether Timmy had matured in the stretches of a frozen ocean or the shores of a snowy beach, aging into a fine and handsome cold frog would have still been his destiny, and it looks like it's one shared by those here before him, his new family of his new home. T Timmy, no! This species just cannot be saved. Well, at least for his family of one second, with the efforts of a breeding program, their numbers could multiply quite rapidly, given you have the slime balls, of course. At the time of filming, of all the mobs that can be bred, only chickens and turtles rival the multiply potential frogs have for rapid population expansion. For every two slime balls, you're guaranteed a minimum of two eventual frogs, with the potential for an eventual 10. For perspective purposes, running another cheeky test showed that from using 50 slime balls brought almost double the number of eventual frogs, meaning you can expect with fairness two frogs for every slime ball fed. But again though, given you have the slime balls, they're not necessarily something that's really looted in abundance for the typical player. Unless said player were to no doubt have a slime ball farm. Now, apart from there being some incredible slime ball farm designs out there, thankfully you won't even need to come close to be reigning in slime balls if you want what frogs can offer you, which resurfaces our question from before. These regurgitated balls of slime serve as a hint for why you may want to have a few handfuls handy. The reason for that is, well, slime balls are the key ingredient for crafting leads which is an item you may find could be quite useful if you want to take full advantage of the type of farm frogs are made for. What would that be? One that can only be built in a different realm. The Nether is a place now stranger to none but it's what we're looking for in the nether. That finding could pose a challenge to some. Scattered throughout the reaches of this hell lay colossal ancient ruins that have now been occupied by piglin kind, who can pose quite the threat to those unprepared when they're not distracted. Huh? 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 There are four different types of these piglin inhabited ruins, known as Bastion Remnants, and the one we're looking for is the only place where our frogs can have their farm established. Treasure Room Bastion Remnants Distinct for having an enormous blocky exterior, a bridge stretches over pools of lava that leads its visitors into its interior, the treasure room itself. It's at the bottom of these where we can find a magma cube monster spawner. Yep, small slimes aren't the only cubes hopping around that frogs will hunt. Small magma cubes are also on their hit list. Why may this be of interest to us? To have an unlimited supply of lighting blocks is a tantalizing prospect for any type of survivalist. And with three different colors on offer, where do we start? Your choice, which colors you want. See, when a frog eats a small magma cube, they spit out a frog light that resembles their color. So if you want an endless supply of ochre frog lights, you're gonna need to round up some temperate frogs. An endless supply for the pearlescent frog lights? Then you wanna go capture some warm frogs. Or perhaps you fancy endless verdant frog lights. For these, you wanna get a hold of some cold frogs. 
If you want an endless supply of two of them, or even all three, then the bigger your quest becomes, but the bigger your reward. Including the When the Squad Hops Into Town achievement, if you're able to get each frog variant on a lead. Being that small magma cubes spawn from the treasure room's monster spawner that's deep inside the nether, this essentially details your quest description for you. Collect your chosen frogs, take them through a nether portal, and escort them to the magma cube monster spawner. Safely. Whoa, whoa. This was a terrible idea. Since water evaporates in the nether, this place serves no option for us to simply carry in buckets of tadpoles to grow into frogs here. No, your frogs are going on a journey. And given the geographical implications of this particular realm, this type of journey may pose a complication or two. But I have an idea. Please no, don't take that advice. You can start your quest by seeking out a treasure room bastion remnant. These can be quite difficult to find, so you may want to do this first. Upon one's discovery, you'll want to head to the very bottom of the treasure room itself, find the magma cube monster spawner, and build a nether portal nearby. Head on through, and keep note of the coordinates of the nether portal in the overworld. Now, you have quite a few options to take from here, depending on your resources and preferences. Ultimately, you want to create an enclosure for the frogs that you wish to produce frog lights for you. Whether that means choosing one, two, or three different frog variants to be bred in one, two, or three different enclosures, it's up to you. Just be mindful not to underestimate their jumping ability, avoiding to build an enclosure with walls that won't prevent them from escaping. To be on the safe side, best box off a frog enclosure unless you're willing to build some very high walls. Once your enclosure or enclosures are established and their location's coordinates safely noted, then it's time to begin the breeding program. Depending on the location of where your nether portal spawned in the overworld, the one that takes you directly to the magma cube monster spawner, it may already be in a biome that matures tadpoles into the variant of frog that you're after. If that's the case, and you're after convenience, then that's one less journey you're going to have to make. What journey? Escorting your frogs through the overworld to your new nether portal. Better done here than in the nether. And this is where leads come in handy. No matter which travel method you're able or wish to take, you want to fetch your fellow frogs from wherever they're based and take them on an adventure they won't forget. Or will forget, depending on how many make the journey. Which is why you may want to bring more frogs than you need. And the good news is, you only really need at least four frogs to inhabit your frog light farm for it to run effectively. But any more than four will no doubt help out a bit with your frog's time to kill with their magma murder spree. Six frogs I'd say is probably ideal, but four will definitely do the trick. You can round them up now, or do this once you've constructed your frog light farm. There are some great tutorials out there to choose from with different methods of collecting these frog lights. So simply go with whatever concept that takes your fancy and suits your needs. This one here utilizes blocks of snow to break down all the medium and large size magma cubes into the smallies, of which my frogs will lick away, dropping their respective frog lights. An automated hopper cart system sweeps up the frog lights on the surface from below, sending them all directly into a chest ready for collection. And the first time you have all three frog lights in your inventory, you'll complete the With Our Powers Combined Challenge achievement, the third and final tier of frog achievements. All the magma cream dropped by the larger magma cubes when they perish just becomes bonus loot for your farm's keeping. Frog light farms are well worth the investment 
and the adventure it sends you on to. A self-sustaining farm with no maintenance needed, in turn offering free, infinite, decorative light blocks that are able to be placed in three different orientations to illuminate your ever-expanding base with. Not too shabby at all. So, was there much to know about Minecraft's frog after all? No, not really. Kinda got a little carried away there. Probably a bit too much unnecessary stuff, but hey, I'm happy if you still found it interesting enough. Alrighty, I'll see you in another three years. Goodbye! I'm only kidding. Okay, bye!